Hello and welcome to Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show. I'm George. And I'm Jeff. And we're having a live show, live from the interwebs. Yay! Ooh. Well, we're live right now. Well, we're live for us right now, but we're not live for, for everybody oh. else right now. That's how that works. I wondered if you were like photocopying this is how you were making it. it yes, I'm going to a Xerox machine, okay. and I'm just photocopying our audio patterns off of the Xerox machine. And then I'm handing them out on street corners going, hey, go. listen to Communicore Weekly. It's the greatest online show. So but, we're going to be live on the interwebs at, what's that address, Livestream? Livestream.com slash Communicore Weekly. Cool. Easy so, enough to remember. Yes. Monday, March 11th, uh, 9.30 p.m. Eastern or Walt Disney World time, as we like to call it. Uh, yeah. 6.30 p.m. Uh, Pacific or Disneyland time, as Disneylanders yeah. like to call it. <laughs> the only true time zones that yes, matter. Yes, the only ones that matter. We don't know any other time zones. Sorry yeah. for you people in the middle. You don't have, again, you don't have Walt Disney. I mean, you don't have Disney theme parks, so it's hard so, for us to know your time. Yeah. But, uh all the details will be on our website and uh, facebook.com slash Communicore Weekly. So go to the live show because it's going to be fun. We have a good history segment. We're going to do live stuff with the audience, and it's going to be great. So you should I go. I thought you were going to say live juggling. I was like, dude, I do not know how to juggle. Oh. Well, I know how to juggle, so we could if you really wanted to. Hmm. Okay. Okay. And I, I mean, I'm not. Play by play. I don't want to show you up or anything. Well, wouldn't be the second time. So, or the first time. Or, one, or sometime. Or sometime. Or any time at all. Fair enough. Fair enough. It's time for Disney History! Now, as you enter Disneyland and you stroll down Main Street, USA, on your way towards uh, Sleeping Beauty Castle, and you continue past the Silhouette Studio on the right-hand side. Now, next to that studio is a Victorian facade with a small front porch. And a few steps lead up to a bench and two chairs that offer a moment of rest from a hard, day, hard day's walking or maybe an early morning breather. I don't know. Maybe you're out of breath already. <laughs> maybe you ran from your hotel to Disneyland. It's possible. It could happen. Or um, your ECV needs to be recharged. Th there is a plug there, so I think you can okay, do that. Good. But now the facades along Main Street are right up to the build to line, which is a, was a way to regulate where a building's facade must be placed. However, this, this one porch is the exception to the rule. Yeah, the porch represents something that was common during the Victorian age. You know, residential areas sometimes were converted into commercial districts. The porch was the last house on the block that was not torn down during the building of the central business district. Though it may have been a store in its long life, the porch still clings to its heritage. Yeah, but of course, the history of the porch doesn't end there. In fact, it gets even more interesting, if you could believe it. Oh. Ah. See, for many folks who had been to Disneyland when the, parks, uh, when the park first opened, or you, you know, know of its history, like us uh, history nerds, you, <laughs> you know that this is where the Wizard of Bras was located. So, George, in the unlikely event that you needed lingerie when you were visiting Disneyland, this would be the place you would go. Yeah, especially during the first few years, uh, when everybody was wearing full suits. Because, you know, you know maybe up. maybe you wanted to feel sexy as you were on the Matterhorn. Hey, I don't know. You never know. Not never the know. Matterhorn. The Matterhorn didn't open until later. Pick, let That's me okay. pick it. What's an opening day ride? Quick, I need to read myself in, in Disney nerd eyes. Uh, carousel, when you're on the carousel. Okay, go. Uh, yes, you want the wind blowing through your hair while you're wearing your nicest lingerie. Perfect. That'll work. All right, so, so when the park did open in 1955, uh, most of the shops along Main Street were licensees. Walt didn't, of course, he didn't have enough money to do everything in the park, so he leased some of the things to outside companies, like the Main Street stores, to raise the extra cash that he needed to finish building Disneyland. And one of the very first vendors to lease from Disney was Hollywood Maxwell's Intimate Apparel Shop. Now, the, the Hollywood Maxwell Brazier Company itself was founded in Los Angeles in the 1930s and rose to fame with its unique bra, the circular-stitched V-Vet Whirlpool, 
which soon became a much sought after fashion item. They were the uh, largest bra manufacturer west of the Mississippi. Now, like I said earlier, the store was the only place to buy lingerie and brassieres in the park, and at the same time, learn about the history of underwear in the museum that they had inside the store. Now, your host through the tour through the history of underwear is the wonderful Wizard of Bras, who was, uh, <laughs> first of all, best marketing name ever. That's yes. number one. He was also the symbol of the Hollywood Maxwell Brazier Company, and he would talk to you from his revolving stage through a the magic of uh, tape recordings, actually. And on one side of the stage was a, a complete recreation of the fashions of in- and intimate wear of the uh, 1890s, and on the other side was a showing of the fashions of 1955, both inner and outer wear. So a little known fact that the carousel of progress was a precedent to the carousel of progress. I, I can't even. I can't even respond to that one. No? Okay, well then we'll just move on. So the, uh, the, the remaining part of the store was decorated to a Victorian theme as if it was the front room of the house, complete with period, uh, fireplace, drapes, a large mirror, sofa, and old-fashioned showcase. There was, an, uh, there was also an authentic Singer sewing machine from around 1860, and some 3D illusion boxes that would allow guests to see models' clothes disappear to show their undergarments underneath. Now, just just for the record, I want to say they weren't actual models. They were like mannequins and pictures. They weren't, you know, women standing there that would, you know, have their clothes on, and then you would look another way, and they would take their clothes off because, come on. Oops. (laughs) Sucker. (laughs) Fell off. No, that this is Disneyland. Come on, guys. Grow up a little bit. Jeez. Now, uh, there's actually a a lot of speculation as to why this building was built with a porch, uh, built with a porch to begin with, and... There's no real reason, but there's a couple of theories. One was that it could be so children couldn't just look into the windows while passing by, you know, like they do in all the other windows on Main Street, so they can see all the wondrous things inside. Because, let's face it, when you're a kid, that kind of thing is embarrassing. So, so children or Communicore Weekly co-hosts. Exactly. They did not want us just peeking in the windows. (laughs) You know, in in all fairness, it also could have been just a resting place for men to hang out outside while their their lady folks uh, were shopping inside. So maybe they didn't want to get embarrassed either. I don't know. Uh, but in any event, the Intimate Apparel Shop didn't last long. In January 1956, just half a year after it opened, it closed. Um, the, class, the Glass and China Shop, which was next door, expanded and absorbed the Internet Apparel. Internet, oh my god. The Intimate. The internet. <laughs> granted, still makes sense. Intimate exactly. Apparel Shop uh, space, and the door itself was sealed in 1959. Uh, the porch actually still remains today as an inviting spot to just sit and watch the passing crowds. And of course, this is also the current location of Disney Legend in my friend Rolling Crumb's window. So it's it's kind of fitting that such a bizarre store is now the home to a tribute to one of the Disney Company's most unique individuals. He's a nerd, he's a geek, geek. but we all like to hear him speak. So listen up to the words from his speech. It's George's Book of the Week. So for this week's Book of the Week, uh, both Jeff and I got review copies of the unofficial Walt Disney World Earbook 2012 by Kevin Yee, who also is another Mice Chat writer. And uh, this is the third book in the series. He did one in 2010 and 2011. And it's gotten bigger. On the inside? On the inside, just like the TARDIS. No, uh, the format of the book is actually much larger. And uh, he, he didn't really lose as much of the content. The idea behind the book is that he's putting together a uh, sort of like a time capsule for the future where he visits Walt Disney World pretty much every weekend and a lot during the week and gets invited to all these cool things and photographs everything and documents what changed or what happened over the year. You know, like this one covers when President Obama visited to special parades, when attractions closed, when new things opened, changes in restaurants, just about anything major that happened during the year. When, when attractions at Epcot uh, went into soft opening and then quickly closed because they were offensive to people. <laughs> you know, things like that. <laughs> yes, which does happen. Which does happen, <laughs> apparently. Yes. A lot more often now than it did before. So, you know, it's sort of like one of those books that they used to publish at the end of the encyclopedias that would look at everything that happened, politics, entertainment, religion over the past year, except this is all focused on Walt Disney World. And there are a lot of color pictures, too. So it's not just a litany of facts. 
you know, it is a lot of photographs. It's got a really good layout, a really good design. Um, right off the bat, my only complaint is I wish it were larger. But, you know, he said he's kept it at that size, uh, that number of pages to keep the price down. So a lot more people can purchase it. Yeah, and I think it, it's a really cool idea that he's doing too. I know I like that he's been doing it the last three years. It's essentially a snapshot in time for mm. Walt Disney World uh, history. So, you know, think of it like your school year is ending and you're buying a yearbook so you can relive all those memories from, from high school all over again. That's what this is. It's a yearbook for Walt Disney World. And it's cool even now at the end of the year to look back and see the stuff that Walt Disney World has done throughout this year. But I think it's going to be an invaluable research tool in like 50 years time when uh, future Communicore cadets are doing research on the vintage Walt Disney World from 2013. And uh, <laughs> this is going to be like a great research tool for them. It's, it, I mean, he covers every major thing that happens in the park. And I think one of my favorite things, it seems weird, but he does a thing where it's like a, a day snapshot where he picks oh, a random yeah. day. At, it's, the, it's like one page at the end of the book. I think it's like a day in June he picks and he has all the park hours, you know, ticket prices, just random stuff specifically from that day. Just so oh, in, including food prices. As yeah. Well. And food they, prices not, too. Not yeah. every restaurant, but I guess the restaurant that his family visited for the day yeah so you know when you know how george now you have an obsession with the odyssey at epcot yes so you know when someone has an obsession with pecos bill in 50 mm -hmm. years they're going to be able to see what food was served how much it was and you know yeah. all the really nerdy details that only disney nerds like us are really that interested and, and in all of our in. listeners of course oh yes of course and, i mean watchiners no watchiners watchiners um, watchiners and listeners but, but i mean i don't know how many times well personally me I wanted to go back and see what food was served at the Magic Kingdom in the 70s because it was a much different fare than it is today. It was much more pedestrian. A lot more chili and soups and sandwiches were served. And it would be fantastic to see the prices. So I'm glad Kevin has documented a lot of this information and put it in one source. Um, it, it's a little nerdy, you know, but it is something you're going to grab and in a couple years you're going to look at and really enjoy and go, oh, I remember when they did that. I remember when I had that horrible idea. You know, which is more Kevin's often than not nowadays. Bad. No, yeah, yeah was, Kevin's book was not the bad idea. Which I want no, no, Disney no, doing that bad yeah, idea. Talking about with Disney doing some bad things. So, um, you know, I think this is another book to add to all of our listeners' growing library collections at home, especially people that might want to do research in the future or you know just take a look back. And and it's cheap, yeah. so you know, totally yeah. worth the, the cover price. I I would say definitely buy it. Yeah. Should we should we say that like put a call out that you know. Kevin's family, they're, they're starving and his kids don't have shoes or something like that. So if you buy the book, you're going to help feed his family or something? I mean, we could. It, it wouldn't be true, no, but we no. could definitely say that we if you wanted say that, to say that. It wouldn't be true. So, so okay, but please buy from the Book of Ye so you can help feed his family. <laughs> exactly. And this one is uh, the unofficial Walt Disney World Earbook 2012 by Kevin Ye. What we liked, what we didn't like, yeah, he's in the booze! 60 Second Review! So when the Contemporary Resort and the Polynesian Village Resort were opened, part of the decor in the room uh, was a massive wall map of the Vacation Kingdom of the World. And a lot of us have seen this map on eBay and other places. Uh, it was used in various versions of the Story of Walt Disney World Commemorative Edition, which is that really big D-shaped book that they did in the, the early 70s. Um, the map originally was 5 foot by 4 foot, or 60 inches by 48 inches, and was printed on masonite. Uh, they were framed and actually adhered to the wall. And the story about the maps go that, the crow, that they used crowbars to remove the maps, and uh, damaged or destroyed a lot because they weren't seen as collectible when they refurbished the rooms in the 1980s. Yeah, so these things are really hard to come by, and they're they're pretty much jewels of any Disney fans, uh, Walt Disney World fans collection. But mm -hmm. the good news for people like us now is that there is a way to get a copy of this map uh, hey. at the same same sizes and. You know, fantastic quality. Actually, let me backtrack. It's not the same map. It's almost a an artistic um, interpretation. An artistic, yeah, interpretation, reproduction. Yeah, that's it. But 
I mean, you really won't be able to tell the difference because it looks so similar and it's fantastic. Um, George and I both uh, bought copies of the, of, of the map and it looks fantastic. Um, they're huge, um, but it's totally, totally awesome and I can't wait to hang it up on my wall. Which, George, you're getting yours framed now, aren't you? Yes, we, we're getting it. It's in the frame shop now because um, I let my wife pick out the, uh, the material. And she's got expensive tastes. Obviously, she knows she married me. But um, the <laughs> but um, this thing is massive. Rolled it out on the kitchen floor, and it took up almost most of the space in the kitchen. Uh, we've got like two walls in this house. We've got vaulted ceilings in the family room where we can hang it. Uh, but they, the, he is offering three sizes. And I'll be honest with you. I mean, I, if you don't go big, you know. It's just one of those things where you're going to pay a little bit more for the large size, but it is spectacular. It's I mean, totally it covers, worth it. it. It covers the Magic Kingdom pre-opening, so you get to see the image of the hotel that was on Main Street, some of the buildings in Liberty Square that were never built, uh, the unbuilt hotels of the Seven Seas Lagoon, the Venetian, the Persian, and the Asian are on there. Uh, the Stallport is shown on the map as well. It's just, it's a fantastic reproduction, and it's one of those things where I've seen it for about a year, and I, and I just never wanted to pull the trigger on it because I thought it was kind of expensive. But it's on a, it's printed on a really heavy canvas, so it's high quality. The printing process is fantastic. Um, it comes shipped in a really long tube. So there's you, really no chance of damage at all. Well, like, but I was know. thinking you could, you know, use the tube to hit people with. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, you could have, like, lightsaber fights with people if you oh, wanted definitely, to with the tube. Oh, definitely. We have to go doubt. outside probably, though. Yeah, because they are big. All right, so now, now we're talking about it, and you're probably wondering, okay, how do I get this map? We yes. probably should have told you that from the beginning. So no, that's okay. We would that's have fine. hook them, reel them in first. That's it. We reel really, you we really win with it. Yes, um, yes. WDWmap.com is where you can get it. And it's it's uh, a guy named Chad. He's very nice, very friendly. We, we've been talking to him for a while. And, you know, he did a wonderful, wonderful job with this. And special, special offer for all you Kumnikor cadets out there. Um, he's actually offering all sizes of the map, all three sizes, 10% off for anyone who is listening to this review and uh, wants to purchase one. Um, you can go to wdwmap.com slash cwdiscount.html. Um, we'll put that on our website. We'll put it on the Facebook. We'll put it in the show notes as well in case you want to go and check it out. But 10% um, discount on this map, totally, totally worth it, I think. I think it's worth it for the other prices too, just to have this... It is you know, reproduction, uh, artistic rendering of uh, Walt Disney World early history in your house because I'm telling you, I can't wait to hang it up on my wall. It looks I know, phenomenal. It's, it, it's got Discovery Island. Well, back then, Raz Island, Treasure Island, as it was called, and you can see some of the build out of uh, Bay Lake as well. Oh, it's gorgeous. Um, even even um, my mother-in-law, who is not a big fan of Disney, saw the map and thought it was absolutely positively gorgeous. So I think this is a, a definite Communicore Weekly three thumbs up. Yes, absolutely. So again, wdwmap.com slash cwdiscount.html. Um, we'll be on our website too. Definitely pick one up. Sometimes you might see it, sometimes you don't. Hey, look, what's that? It's a five-legged goat. When pirates took over Tom Sawyer Island at Disneyland in 2007, the contractors there, uh, they found something very interesting when they were uh, building this reimagined version. So, somewhere on the old foundations of the island from 1956, there was a wall that was uh, bricked up. And when the builders, they started to take the wall down, they found their own little, tre their own little hidden treasure back there. It was a, a secret stash of 50-year-old Coca-Cola bottles. And along with the bottles was a note that said, enjoy a Coke. So no one knows who put the bottles there or why they put the bottles there. And nor do we know if any of the builders actually enjoyed a 50-year-old Coca-Cola. Well, thanks so much for watching, listening, and absorbing. Yeah, be sure to leave us a comment and rate us on iTunes. And send us emails, lovely, lovely emails, at communicorweekly at gmail.com. Also, like us on the Facebook at facebook.com slash Weekly. 
Yep. Don't forget to check out the information for the live show and the map discount. Exactly. It'll be up so, there very soon. Yep. And uh, follow us on Twitter. I'm at Imagine Nerding, and he's at Jeff Heimbuck. I'm George. And I'm Jeff. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time on Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show. Turkey Lane.